Stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. I want to share with you a couple of things. It's good to see you. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you're looking good today. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you got some work to do. No, I don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> Come on, turn to somebody right now. You feel they need to hear it and say, man, God is good to you. We want to get right into the Word today. Before we do that, I just want to encourage you, if you are a person who's believing in this revival or in this season that God's going to bring loved ones to Him, you're wanting them to be saved, you're wanting their lives to be changed, maybe they're backslidden, you want them to come home to God, please take one of these cards that sits in the a seat back in front of you, fill it out and say, hey, look, I'm going to take that step of faith today and put their name down and believe God to move on their behalf. Uh, we had somebody do this, that, that they, they started the fast with a family member in mind. And before, I mean, the first day of the fast, their family member came to church, gave their life to Jesus. I think that's awesome. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. During this prayer and fasting, there's been so many great things happen. We had a young man that uh, was diagnosed with hyperthyroidism, and uh, they were hooking him up with a specialist and trying to figure out what the treatment plan was going to be. Went back to the doctor to get his latest test. They took his blood and everything, and they said, not only do you not have that, but we can't find anything wrong with you. How, how about let's give God a hand clap of praise for that. We've had some, a, a lady that was healed of cancer. I think God, God's worthy of praise for that. Come on. So we believe God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So let's put their name down. Let's pray for them. These names will never be seen by anybody, but except our prayer team and our staff. And we're not making that public. We're not going to embarrass anybody. But you know what? If you'll come into agreement, I believe you know, there's power in agreement. When we set our faith with other people, man, God will move on people's behalf, right? So we want God to show them his love and reveal his heart and use us to reach them. Come on, somebody. We don't want to just have a harvest coming. The harvest don't just come in by itself. How many of y'all realize that? You, you ranchers and farmers around here, you know. Come on, harvest don't just come in. You don't go plant the seed and then someday you go out into the whatever you keep the grain in and you say, hey, it's full. That was awesome. And the, and the, and the fields are, I see y'all laughing at me, and the fields are, you know, done. That don't happen like that. Do it. <laughs> okay. Now we are the harvest hands. Amen. We got to go out and do what God's asking us to do. And so uh, also I wanted to encourage you with this prayer guide. We're still doing pr uh, 21 days of fasting and prayer every day uh, this week at Facebook, 6.30 a.m., live streaming prayer. You can join us for that. And then just get one of these prayer guides. Even if you aren't able to join us for that, man, this will help your prayer life, I'm telling you, in significant ways. So you'll notice that in your seat, there's five to ten invite cards. It just says you're invited at Summit Church. There's a place for you. I want to use that this week. I want you to commit to take every one of those in the chair that you're sitting in and the chairs beside you, if there's no one sitting there, I want you to take those and I want you to commit that you're going to invite people to the revival this next weekend. Saturday night, 6.30, Sunday morning, uh, 10.30, Sunday night, 6 p.m., I mean 6.30 p.m. And, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun. Afterwards, we're going to have an after party where we have, you know, food trucks out there and cornhole and all that. I know you guys love that cornhole. Some of y'all are. N anyway, let's move on. Uh, so uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. But you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm excited about that and the fellowship and the connection we're going to make. But you know what? I'm more excited about what God is going to do. Because we've gone through 21 days of fasting and prayer. And we're gonna, it's going to culminate in that revival weekend. And so I'm just praying. The guys that are coming to speak to you, I'm telling you, they are going to blow your socks off. God's going to move to use them to minister your life. Please, listen to me. Please be here. It, not because we want it to be a great turnout. It'll be a great turnout. I'm not worried about that. But please be here because I don't want you to miss what God's trying to do in your life. Okay? And let me ask you one more thing. Don't come by yourself. If you have somebody who has need in your life, you have somebody who wants to, uh, you know, needs Jesus or somebody who just needs God to move in their life and on their behalf, bring them and be in this house and be around God's people. Let's see God do something great. Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. Amen, church? God's going to do something great in your life. You say, well, pastor, I have something going. I just have one question for you. Is it more important than your relationship with God? That's all. That's all I want to ask you is, I want you to ask yourself that question. Is it really more important? Well, my kids have this. And my kids have, Is it more important than your relationship with Jesus? Is it more important for what may happen in your kid's life, in your life? In your family's life. Amen? Amen. God's good. 
All right, let's get into the Word this morning. I'm going to finish this message series up called Awakening. And I've got a, a good word for you today called This Little Light of Mine. Turn to your neighbor, hold your finger up, and say, This Little Light of Mine. <laughs> Some of you are like, man, stop telling me what to do. Let's say our confession before we get into our word. I want to welcome everybody who's a part of our worship experience today. Whether you're in the room, whether you're watching us by live stream, or whether you are uh, listening to us by podcast. Come on, let's welcome everybody who's a part of the Ch- Summit Church family. Yeah, we love you. We got people from all over the world, a part of our family, and we're excited about it. Let's say our confession today. Grab your Bible or your uh, electronic device, and let's say our confession. I love the Word. I love to read the Word. I love to study the Word. I love to speak the Word. I love to pray the Word. I love to share the Word. I love to hear my pastors teach the Word. I love the Word. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise for His Word. All right. We just love the Bible. We love what God's teaching us. Romans chapter 13, verse 11, out of the Amplified Bible. Everybody read it with me. Do this, knowing that this is a critical time. It is already the hour for you to awaken from your sleep of spiritual complacency. For our salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed in Christ. Father, we thank you for your word. We praise you today. We ask you to deposit it deep in our hearts and cause us to bear fruit that changes our lives and the lives of everybody around us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 You can be seated. Now, I'm going to sit down today. I don't normally sit down very much, but I'm going to sit down today because, as you can see, I have a boot on my left foot. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, man, our pastor's so athletic and he's... He's always doing something, and he's probably trying to run a triathlon, or he was probably, you know, I try, you know, I get to stand on the sidelines at the football games on Friday night and and help help with the football team, and I just keep thinking, man, we're beating people so bad, I keep thinking he's going he's going to put me in one of these days. He's going to put me in. Uh, That didn't happen. Um, I was watching a comedian on uh, Facebook the other day, and she was about my age, a little older than me, and she was making jokes about the idea of when you get older you can just injure yourself doing nothing and I was laughing about it. I was like oh that's stupid <laughs> you're so dumb well uh, so so I went to the movies uh, with Sydney's uh, boyfriend I went to the movie he and I went to the movies the other day and uh, last night actually and was it last night yes last night and uh, um I was just watching the movie, you know, we're just having a good time. It's just a, a, a man's flick, you know, and we just said, you know, mm, yeah, yeah. And I was sitting there and I was like, man, I, I'm, before the action starts, I'm, I got to go to the restroom. So uh, another thing you do when you get older, but I, 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 uh, I, I decided um, I, I'm going to go right now. So I get up and I head out, I head out of, the, of the theater and I'm going down the stairs and and, uh, you know, the, I've got these Jordans that are not high tops, and they, 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 they always come untied. I don't know what's wrong with the shoe strings, but they always come untied. And so my shoe was untied. I didn't realize it, so it made my shoe real loose. So I got to the bottom of the stairs, the bottom of the stairs, y'all. I was almost there. And uh, when my foot hit the bottom of that stairs, all, all I know is, all I know is it went the wrong direction. I mean, it was just bent. It was like, bam, and I heard it go, pop. Don't that, don't that, oh, it hurt. I'm going to tell you something, though, my pride. I grabbed a hold of that rail, and with everything in me, I would not let myself fall. No one even knew what happened. I was like, wham, oh, God. I, I, I was saying, I, Braxton, I don't know how you didn't hear me down there, because literally I was going, oh, oh. It hurt. So your pastor messed his foot up really bad last night going to the movies. Uh, be quiet. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so today, I, I just want to warn you, you know, this scripture, this text that we're using, it says, uh, it says that we know that this is a critical time. It's already the hour for you to awaken from your sleep of spiritual complacency, for your salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. And it goes on to say, let us put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light Let us cast off those things in the dark. He's saying, stay out of the dark. So when we want revival in our lives, we want God to move in our lives, 
every area that's dark in us, everything that we keep finding ourselves involved in that's in the darkness, or things that we know that need to change in our lives that we won't change, or things that are in darkness you need to get out of the darkness. I'm just telling you, the dark movie theater can destroy you, man. I'm telling you. So uh, don't be in the dark. Because the reality is, I'm serious, the reality is when you find yourself in the dark, things are going to, I love what someone said. Someone said, sin will always take, take you further than you want to go to places you don't want to go and, 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 and mess your life up in ways that you don't want it to happen. And it never feels like that when we're engaging in things that are, seem pleasurable to us. But the truth is, at some point, the darkness of that will overwhelm us. And we need to make sure we're not living in the dark, but we're living in the light. Everybody, amen? So today I want to talk to you on the subject of this little light of mine. And uh, I'm, I, we've been talking about waking up. I'm going to stand up because I can't take it. Uh, we're gonna, we're, we've been talking about waking up. If I fall over and, and, and I take this thing with me, it's all just going to be a memorable thing for you. So don't worry about it. You're just going to laugh and say, man, our pastor fell over. You're laughing. You'll mock me. Don't you mock people when they fall? Don't lie. Y'all, some of y'all's favorite video is those videos that they just one fall after another. That's definitely my fault. I mean, my, my, I just laugh. I just cackle. My wife has weak ankles. She'll fall down. She just falls down sometimes. Ask the lady. She fell down at the meeting the other day. She's like, man. But, you know, we're so old now we just laugh about it. One time we were coming out of our church, Church of the Harvest, and uh, when, when I was a senior associate at Church of the Harvest in Oklahoma City, and we were coming out, and Pastor Kirk stand by me, and we were walking out to our car, and it was kind of dark out there, and there was a little bitty hole in the grass, and Janae just found it, and her weak ankle, t- weak ankle turned over. And there's something about her. I don't know what it is, but most people just fall really hard to the ground. She floats. I don't know what it is, but she just has this way. She's done it so many times. She just has this way of kind of just, it, I don't know, it's weird. It's just like she, she just kind of floats to the the ground and so so it's happened so many times like I, mean, I can't even describe to you how many times and you guys are looking at me like man you are laughing at your wife falling but it was funny and I, and and she fell down and pastor kirk was like he'd never seen that before he's like oh my god janae are you okay i said i oh, don't worry about it. she does all the time <laughs> and she just laid there laughed and then i helped her up we got in the car and went home the truth is it's important for us to stay out of the dark It's important because we're going to fall. We're going to hurt ourselves. And you know, God, when he encourages us or challenges us, or your pastor teaches to you about the word of God and what it says to us about how we live our lives and what our lives should be like, sometimes we just have this feeling of, you know, I I, I want to do what I want to do. I want to go the direction I want to go. I'll give this part of my life to God, but I don't want to give that part of my life to God. And what you don't understand is God's not mad at you and God's not like pointing his finger at you. God's not trying to steal your fun. God's not trying to mess with your life. God's not trying to keep you from having all the freedom you want because you're not realizing though that some of the things you're chasing for freedom are really bondage packaged in freedom looking package. And ultimately, I can tell you from experience that you follow that path. At some point, you're going to find yourself fallen. It's so funny to me how many people have come into my office over the years, 30 years of ministry, and man, I don't know what's wrong with my marriage, and I don't, and you just let them start talking, and you ask them questions, and what about this, and what about, funny, funny thing about all of us, we really know what the problem is most of the time. All we need is somebody to ask us the right questions, right? And, and, and what we do when we go to counselors sometimes is what we want, is we want them to pat us on the back and say, it's all right, it's good, no problem, no worries, But that is not the way life works, y'all. And and, and what we do is we talk enough, we ask the right questions, we'll find out and figure out pretty quick that there's some darkness involved that's causing things to fall apart. And it needs to be dealt with and so that you don't fall in those holes and you don't wreck yourself and you don't mess with yourself. God is saying to you, I'm your dad and I know what's best for you. And when you mess with things that aren't for you, what will happen is it'll destroy your life. It'll destroy the lives of the people around you. Just look, account after account after account in the history of the word. But let's go further than that. Just know somebody. You know somebody. You know somebody that this has happened to their life. And it's funny to me how we'll make excuses. How many of y'all know about excuses? We make excuses and we'll say that, oh, well, it was this and it was that, and I, I don't know. Why did I apply this? And it's so many people pointing fingers at hypocrites in church. Well, you just hit, I don't go down there anymore because there's too many hypocrites. That, that, that in of itself is hypocritical because the truth is the reason you're not going is because there's something in your life that you don't want to be uncovered and revealed. Come on, somebody. I'm not up here by myself. It's the truth. 
Because when we come in and we sit under the word, God lays us bare. God starts dealing with our heart. The Bible says the word of God is like a sword that separates the soul and the will and all these things. And what happens is it gets down deep in our heart and it starts messing with us. It's called conviction of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say that word after me, conviction. Conviction is always a challenge for better life for you. Conviction is always something God is saying, hey, turn this corner. Hey, don't go that direction. Hey, 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 stop right there. Stop right there. You're about to mess yourself up. I'm trying to help you here. That's what God is saying to you. I'm trying to help you. As your dad, I'm trying to help you. But some, some, something's happened in the church world today. We've gotten confused. We've gotten confused between the word conviction and the word condemnation. And the word condemnation means to be condemned. It means that you've judged, jury, executioner. You are condemned. It means that it's what the devil does. He points an accusing finger at you when you do make a mistake and see, see, I know you couldn't do it. See, you're bad. See, you'll never make it to heaven. See, God doesn't love you. That's all a lie, and that's what the devil does. But there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. And we better be careful that when the Holy Spirit comes and convicts us and just kind of puts that red light in front of us and kind of says, hey, watch out, this curve, there's a curve around here. You don't see it, but you're going to careen off of it if you don't pay attention. And we better listen to that. And stop going, hey, I don't receive that condemnation. That made me feel bad. Hey, are you with me? Because here's what happens when we harden our hearts. That's what the Bible says, harden your heart. When we are stiff-necked, that's what happened to the children of Israel in the wilderness. And that's why they couldn't go into the promise. And another gen- they had to die and another generation had to come behind them to get the promise because they were stiff-necked and hard-hearted, rebellious towards God. When God dealt with them, they wouldn't have it. And when the Holy Spirit comes to you and says, hey, 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 wake up. What are you doing? You're about to run your marriage, boy. Hey, 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 mama, you're about to run that relationship with that kid. Hey, son, you're going to wreck yourself if you don't start being submissive to your parents. Hey, anybody in here with me? So that's the truth. We need to learn how to listen to the heart of God speaking to our heart and saying, I want what's best for you. I want your life to be filled with joy. I want your life to be filled with peace. I want your life to be filled with love. I want your life to be filled with compassion. I want your life to be filled with grace. And when you mess up, it's okay. You have an advocate with the Father, which is Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he will set you free. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Come on. You ought to be shouting me down over that right there why because we can go boldly into the throne room of grace and receive mercy in our time of need why because jesus loves you he does not hate you he's not mad at you he's not angry towards you but he does want your life to be the best that it can be the whole plot of this whole thing is romans chapter 8 verse 29 he said that his purpose for us is that we be conformed into the image of his dear son and i have to say that if we don't listen to the holy spirit and allow him to lead us to that place we are never going to get there because i don't know about you but on my own I'm pretty weak when you do things in the dark and you fail to get up on time because we've been talking about getting up on time waking up on time this is a critical time man I'm telling you I, I I don't know if you're getting it I don't know if you understand it but for Summit Church this is a critical time god has taken us from one level to another and i know some of you're getting it and boy the prayer time on saturday the the worship and prayer my god it was so powerful if you if if you missed out you missed out because we're not doing another one the next saturday saturday we start the revival so come to the revival you'll get you'll get what you need i'm telling you it is powerful what god's doing it's a critical time and we need to see it as a critical time to move our lives in the direction it needs to go and when you wake up late you miss things. When you wake up late, awkward and weird things can happen. When you wake up late, ask the, ask the five virgins that didn't have enough oil in their lamp. And then they woke up and the virgins that had enough oil in their lamp, the bridegroom came and they went to the party and they were in. But the, the, the ones who weren't prepared, they woke up, but they didn't have enough and they weren't awake spiritually. And then they had to run to market to try to get some oil, but they came back and pounded on the door and, and they wouldn't let them in. Why? Because they weren't ready. They woke up late. Church, we can't wake up late. We're living in a time where Jesus is coming, y'all. Jesus, I I don't care if anybody says that anymore. I don't care if no one believes that anymore. I don't care if there's not a belief in heaven or hell anymore. I don't care what the world thinks. I'm not listening to Goliath about David's battle strategy. Come on. Jesus said he was coming. Our world has given every indication that he is. 
I'm going to be ready. Oh, you going you about to you about to do some end time prophecy? No, I don't know when he's coming. I don't know why it's not. It's, he didn't even. He said you don't need to know this. He said he said you don't need to know this. So I don't know exactly when he's coming, but it's all of our end time. Because you only got at best a hundred years here, and ten of them are probably not going to be very good. Listen to me. So for you, it's your end time. Because that ain't very long. Ask me. I'm 50 and it just seems to be flying. I don't know what's going to happen to me next, y'all. I could be injured just standing here. <laughs> it's ridiculous. One time I was, got up and I was preaching, man. I was preaching at our campus in Midwest City when we were up there and I, I was I was preaching, man, I was, it was a day, I mean, it was a day, and I was preaching, I was pacing that, y'all don't know, I am just dying up here, I was pacing that stage, and I was preaching, and I was stomping my foot, I was like, oh, God, and it was just a powerful, anointed moment, and I felt something weird on my leg, and, uh, and, and, and what had happened was, I woke up really late, <laughs> And uh, we, we were keeping a really fast pace, and we were doing all kinds of activities and moving so fast, and we, we just had so much going on in our life, and, and I knew I had to be at Midwest City Campus, and I, w I woke up late because we'd had a really late night before, probably doing some kind of ministry event, I don't remember, but I, I, I said, I'm going to sleep as long as I can, and I'm going to get in my car, and I've got to drive about 40 minutes to get there, so I just, I just waited, and then I jumped up, and I put my clothes on, and, and I was already ready, and I got my clothes on, and I headed, I headed towards Midwest City, and as I was getting close to Midwest City, I got there, and I got up, and we worked. It was awesome. I got up to preach and I was preaching and I preached. I stomped my foot and it felt weird. I felt like something was crawling up my leg. And I looked down just because I didn't want to draw anybody else's attention to it. I looked down and there was a sock laying on the stage. <laughs> now, you men, you know what happened, don't you? That sock somehow stuck up in my pants. And I'm just thanking God it wasn't something else, y'all. I'm, I'm just thanking God. I look down. Here's what a preacher does when something happens like that. I look down, and I was like, and God said, I never even act like I saw it. Oh, that hurt. I never even act like I saw it. Just kept going. I just kept preaching. I just kept doing it. Why? But you know what? In life, when we wake up late and we've got all kinds of weird things happen in our life and it's awkward and God's not moving and things are not like they should be, we can act all day long like nothing's happening. We can act all day long there's not a sock sticking out the bottom of our pants. We can act all day long that we shouldn't be embarrassed under the shadow of the things that we've done. Right? You can act all like, I'm a good Christian, everything's good. You know what, we're not here, I'm not here, I'm not here in Canyon, Texas with the vision that God has given us. I am not here to raise up good little Christian women and men. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm not here to raise up a bunch of rule, uh, 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 rule followers. I'm not here to raise up a bunch of people who are just like, everything's together, everything looks good. It's like the Stepford Wise. We all look the same, and we all look, you know, we just have that canyon look about us, and we all just look the same, and we all just feel the same, and we all just project the same. Everything's fine. Everything's good. Hey, am I hitting home with anybody? My ankle hurts. Anybody hears this on podcast, they're going to be like, what is that weird guy? Listen, you can act like, you can act like there's not a sock sticking out your pants, but there is. It's something we used to say, hey, your slip is showing. And all of us, sometimes spiritually, our slip is showing. We're trying to act like it's not showing. Hey, keep your eyes up here. Don't look at all the other stuff that's going on in my life. <laughs> if I fall off this stage and break my other ankle, y'all, I'm just going to quit. Weird things can happen when you wake up late. Scripture says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and through 15 in the Message Bible. It says, let me tell you why you're here. Now, wait a minute. He's saying, let me tell you why you're here. And how often 
do we, even as believers, say, why am I here? What's my purpose? What's my design? Here's what Jesus says. This is not anybody else talking. This is Jesus talking. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. Would everybody please say that together with me? God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city setting on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop on a light stand, shine. Everybody say it with me. Shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. And by opening up with others, you'll prompt people to open up to God, your generous Father in heaven. Being salt, that's what it looks like to be awake. To be vibrantly, spiritually awake and no longer spiritually complacent, which we found out last week, spiritual complacency is nothing more than a pride in self. I'm depending and trusting and relying on me, not on God. I got this, God. I don't need anything else. I got it. That's being awake, being that salt. That salt that when you're around, it changes things. You bring out more flavor. You bring out more preservation. You are there to make a difference, to season. Not any kind of season. You're not, you're not like some kind of, that Connor, Connor puts every time he cooks out at our house, what kind of season is that you put on my, my Uncle Chris. Uncle, what is it, Uncle Chris? Is that actually one of your uncles or is that an actual thing? Okay. Uh, uh, you never know with him. Uh, Uncle Chris's. You got to put that on. You can't just be putting some, some substance of other seasoning. You can't do that. It's got to be Uncle Chris's. It's got to be. It's got to be. You cannot eat. Don't eat that without Uncle Chris's seasoning, right? You ever talk to any griller? They got their seasoning that they use. They'll make it. They'll make it up. Be careful with that. Anyway, the, the truth is, listen, the truth is, it's not just any seasoning we're not just any seasoning. We're the seasoning of God on the earth. God is saying, I put you here to preserve people. I put you here to season my flavor into people's lives. And this is how you do it. I put you here to be a light, to shine into people's lives. Come on. Some of us got too much shadow being casted over our light. Some of us have effectively gone, gone and put a lampstand over our head. On purpose. Stop it. Come on. God is not a secret to be kept. Let's let everybody know. Let's let everybody know the love and the grace and the power and the wonder of God. Let's let everybody know how much he cares, how, how much he can change your life. Let's let everybody know. Tell your story. Asleep just looks like you lost your seasoning. Asleep just looks like you got a bucket covering you. I mean, how many of you know that would be fairly ridiculous looking to see me walk out of here with a bucket over my head? You would be like, I'm not coming to church there anymore. Our pastor's got a problem. But spiritually, we're walking around with buckets on our heads. Come on. And whose darkness are you supposed to be lighting up? That's the question we should be asking of ourselves every single day. God, whose path are you going to take me by that my light is supposed to infiltrate their darkness, that they're bound by the darkness that's over their life, and all it takes is for me to shine. If I'll just shine, it could change everything. If I'll just shine, it can make a difference. If I'll just shine, their marriage could be healed. If I'll just shine, their kids could come home. If I'll just shine, their career could change. If I'll just shine, their life eternal will be set. If I'll just shine. We mess around with the darkness too much. I used to be so scared of the dark. How many of you are ever scared of the dark? Raise your hand if you're scared of the dark. How many of you are still scared of the dark, adults? How many of y'all are lying? You're not going to raise your hand? You raise your hand? Oh, yeah, okay, so we know you now. Anyway. Listen, I used to be so scared of the dark. I had a reason to be scared of the dark. 
And, and here's the, I'm going to make a point here that's going to help you. Because here's the reason some of us still lingering in the dark. Because we're not fearful of God, we're scared of Him. I used to, when I was about 10 or 11, maybe 5th or 6th grade, I was about 10 or 11. And I don't know if y'all ever tried this, but I would, when it was time to go to bed, I would go to my room, my dad said, time to go to bed, I'd go to my room, and I had it worked out of my head how I could jump from the door, flip my light switch off, and land in my bed so that my feet didn't touch the ground or that monster that was under my bed could not grab me. I would be in the bed and the lights would be off and then I could, I could, then I could, then I could do the thing we all know works, put all the covers over me with my feet inside. Because it don't matter how big the monster is, it doesn't matter how dark it is, if I got my covers on, I'm safe. Every 11 year old knows this. I don't know why y'all trying to lie to us. That's why people love blankets so much. And y'all might ought to stop watching them scary movies, you stop being scared. But I would always do that. And I, I always, when I got older, I thought, why would I do that? Why was I so scared of the dark? Uh, and then I realized what my dad used to do to me. I was probably four or five, and I have distinct memories of this. This is not, my mom didn't tell me this story. I have distinct memories of this happening. But how many, how many of y'all have kids that at night they would come to you to try to get in your bed? Because they got scared or something. And we lived in kind of an older house and it was creaky and windows and the, you know, would shake. And, the, and I, so I would always, about four, five, and I could remember I would, I would sneak into my, I'd limp into my dad's room. <laughs> and, I'd, and I'd go up to the bed and I don't know why it never registered in my mind which side of the bed my dad was on and which side of the bed was my mom, my mom was on. And I don't know if they switched sides or probably not because we're creatures of habit. How many of y'all know your spouse cannot sleep on your side of the bed? And I, I, I would go up to the side of the bed and I'd say, Mama, Mama, can I get in your bed? And the nights that I would say it to Mama, I'd end up in the bed. But when I forgot and went to Daddy's side of the bed, I'd say, Mama, Mama, can I say? And right when I'd say, can I, my dad'd say, you better go back to your bed. I'm telling you, I'd go, wah! And I'd just take off running down that hall and get in my bed. And I was no longer scared of the dark in my room. I didn't want no more of that. Someone has lied to you. Someone has made you feel like that's God. God doesn't want you sleeping in his bed. God doesn't want you close to him. God's mad at you because you make mistakes and you fail and you're, you're always messing up. And he's mad at you. And if he plays tricks on you like that, and you're trying to just get some comfort and you're trying to just feel safe. And he don't want you to feel safe. He wants you to be put in your place. And my dad wasn't mean in any of that. He was just mean. Uh, no, just teasing. He's a teaser. And he would tease me like that. But, you know, many of you in your relationship with God, you think God's a tease. You think he's a teaser. You think he's playing tricks on you. He's messing with your life. You think he doesn't really like you. And because of that, you stay in those shadows. You stay in the dark because you've let the devil convince you that you have to stay in the dark because God really isn't there for you and God doesn't really care for you and God's going to pull a trick on you and God's going to pull the rug out from underneath your feet and God doesn't really love you because some person who wasn't very smart got up in a pulpit and preached God that way or some person who you went to their Sunday school class told you that that's the way God was or you had a parent that was harsh and somehow you're relating to God as if he's like, don't misunderstand me God is conviction he will challenge you he will bring your failures to your face he will say hey listen to you know everybody says he was so compassionate and he was so graceful he was but when he when he met with the woman uh, with the issue of blood, I mean, not the issue of blood, but the one who is caught in the act of adultery. And he said, does any man condemn you? Where are your condemners? She said, they're gone. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. 
He didn't fail to confront her problems, but he didn't also fail to love her in the midst of her problems. Your father does not hate you. Your father is not dismissive to you. Your father loves you. Come on out from the darkness and let him see you how you are and let him heal you and let him bind you and let him do the things that he needs to do to fix those wounds and those problems and those situations that you have in your life. Because you could live a victorious life. You could live an abundant life. You could live a life that's full of grace and peace and truth and love. And God wants you to live that life. Are you with me? So why are we here? We're here to influence. My ankle is killing me, y'all, but I cannot stay seated. So I'm just going to have to deal with it. Why are we here? Everybody say this word after me, influence. We're here to influence. You're here to lead people to fulfill the will of God. That's what we're here to do. You, you may not realize, uh, no, 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 wait a minute, Pastor. I'm just coming to church. I'm just trying to be a Christian. I'm just trying to go through the modes. I'm just trying to be saved. I, I ain't trying to be all that. No, 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 that's not your choice. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And he goes on in verse 18, 19, and 20, and he tells us about what his purpose was here on the earth. Jesus said, I came to reconcile man back to God. Because before Jesus came and that sacrifice was made, we couldn't go into the presence of God. Jesus came to bring men back into relationship with him. He wanted that paradise up here. Repent, come up here again. I walked and talked and had communion with Adam and Eve in the garden. I want to have that relationship with you. I can't have it because of sin, because you're sinful and you can't come to me in my presence. Only one man could during, during that period of time was the high priest, and he had to all year sanctify himself and go in and make sacrifice for himself and for us. For the people of Israel but the bottom line is Jesus didn't have to sacrifice for himself because he was the spotless lamb and he was perfect and he was able to go into the throne of God make sacrifice of himself once and for all for all of us we believe on him now we can have relationship with God but then you didn't stop there it'd been great if you stopped there because that's enough right for us but he didn't stop there Paul proceeded to tell us that not only was Jesus had the ministry of reconciliation but now now he's gone back to the Father, he sent us the Holy Spirit, and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, the Bible says you are an ambassador of God as if God was pleading to the world through you to come back in relationship with him. If we really call ourselves Christians, if we really say I'm submitted to the, to the, to the will of Yeshua HaMashiach, if he is my Messiah, if he is my everything, this called one, this anointed one, the one who's caused me to be born again, if he really is, then I know my call, my purpose, the why I am here is ministry of reconciliation. Well, evangelism's not my gift. It doesn't matter if evangelism's your gift. When it says God gives spiritual gifts and one of them is evangelism to someone, that just means they're really, 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 really anointed to do that. But for every single person who calls themselves a Christian, your role is influencing people for Christ, engaging your community, engaging your family, engaging your relationship, engaging your neighbors, influence, leading people to fulfill the will of God. And I oftentimes think of how stingy we are. That we have such grace and such blessing in our life, but we ain't letting everybody else have that. Well, I don't know what they'll think. And I don't, I, you're making a decision for eternity for them because you don't know how they'll respond. What you're really trying to say is, I don't know how they'll feel about me. So you're basing, come on, all of us do this. We're basing, listen, we're basing someone's eternity on whether or not they will feel good about us. Now, I don't like to do guilt trips or anything like that. Not, this is not that. But I wonder if we're standing before God on judgment day, if there aren't going to be somebody in that line looking over and saying, why did you not tell me? Why, why did, you not, did you not love me? Did you not care about me? Well, that's somber, isn't it? Our call is to illuminate the path of purpose for people. 
to shine a light on that path so they can find their way. This is why our vision is lead people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. That's throughout the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. That's what God wants us to do. Know Him, f- find freedom, discover our purpose, make a difference. That's the whole goal of Christianity. And, and we've got to get through there. We've got to disciple, be discipled and grow and develop until we are influencing people's life for the kingdom of God. Move people from where they are to where they need to be. Come on, somebody say amen. And I'm closing with this. I've got 10 seconds. Who give me 10 seconds? Y'all ain't going to do it, are you? Y'all ain't going to do it. They know the trick. Who give me five minutes? Will you give me five minutes? Anybody give me five minutes? Five, 10, 15, 20. All right, there we go. Uh, No, I really am closing. Jesus knows how to fish. He told the disciples, these fishermen, professionals, I'm going to teach you how to fish for men. And then he began to model for them how you do that. How you care about somebody so much that you share the story. How, much you, how, how you care about someone so much that you don't, you don't keep it in reserve for yourself. And you know, I, I think sometimes we look back at the New Testament church and we think, oh, they had it all together. And they were so bold and they were so passionate and they never had any problems. And they just went out there and did it because they were full of the Holy Spirit. And that's how we think about the New Testament church. Can I tell you something? This was written to the New Testament church. They were having these same problems. Why? Because human nature is human nature, and it was the same then as it is now. The same things we're struggling with in ourselves, they struggled with. That's why we look at pictures of them, and we say to ourselves, hey, I can do this. This is why the Apostle Paul said, I haven't got this all together, but I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I don't look at what's behind. I'm only looking at what's before, and I'm going to do the will of God. And every day I have to die to myself, and I have to say I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And it was Paul's declaration where he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation salvation so I have one question for you Jesus came to Peter when he met Peter he came to Peter and he was preaching new rabbi on the scene Peter and John all of them had had their boats they'd been out fishing all night and they came they were on the shore and they were mending their nets and Jesus walked up and said can I borrow your boat they have to understand that his boat was his career His boat was his life. His boat was everything. And he was frustrated. He was frustrated, y'all. He didn't catch a thing. Now that means no money. It wasn't just like, man, we had a bad fishing day. It's not a hobby for them. It was work. It was a living. And that's what he said. He said, let me borrow your boat. And, And here's what God's asking us today. Can I borrow your boat? He's asking us today, can I use your life as a platform for my cause? He gets on that boat and he begins to preach. And then people are listening and he's preaching and Peter's obviously listening and paying attention because then Jesus said, I want you to launch out into the deep. I want you to launch out into the deep. He was on the shore. He was mending nets. He was doing maintenance. He was just being average. But Jesus said, I want you to take your boat that you just allowed me to use as a platform, and I want you to launch out into the deep, and I want you to cast your nets. You go, hey, we've we've fished all night, man. You're a rabbi. I'm a fisherman. Come on. You're a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. Uh, Come on, man. I I know what I'm doing, and we have fished all night, and, and, and we haven't caught anything. But, then he said, but, everybody say, but, at your word. Somehow Jesus had gained credibility with him. Somehow Jesus was, had become an important figure in his mind. And he said, at your word, we will launch out into the deep. Here's what God's saying to us as a church. He's saying to us as a church, listen, let me use your life as a platform. But let's not stay on the bank. Let's launch out into the deep. Let's take that step of faith. Let's go where we haven't gone before. Let's believe what we haven't believed before. Let's do what we haven't done before. Let's minister how we haven't ministered before. Let's touch lives that we haven't touched before. Let's reach into the shadows and reach into the darkness and bang on the gates of hell and say that gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Let's launch. 
Let's pray.